morning. Good morning, South Point Church. Good morning to all of our guests that are joining us for the first Sunday. Uh, I'm just so honored that you would be here. I say this a lot. Sometimes I don't, but I don't ever take for granted the fact that you give up some of your time to come and spend a Sunday with us. I mean, your time is valuable. And so when you come and you give us an hour, hour and 10 minutes, I hope that what you take away is something that makes your whole week better. Uh, So that's something that I know our whole team really shares uh, those feelings. Most buildings have a fire escape plan or a fire emergency plan. We are officially launching our pregnancy emergency plan. For those of you that, for those of you that are new, my wife is pregnant, and the due date was yesterday. So this may be a short message, and you guys may all make it to the spur early for for something to eat. Lindsay, we're going to commandeer your wheelchair if that happens. So. No. Yeah, just in case I run off stage. But anyway, um, I want to start by talking about this, uh, this thing that's happening in our house a lot right now. And it's this concept of bargaining, this idea that, um, that you would bargain with somebody. And I don't mean the kind of bargaining like bargaining with, with prices. I know that if you need to find something cheap in Cape Town, the place that you go to to figure out where to go shopping is you go to Miss Trudy, who runs our family ministries, and she can tell you where all the bargains around town are so that you can get what you need to get. That's not the bargaining that I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is what's happening in our household right now. We currently have a, a three-year-old. Benjamin turned three on Saturday. And every moment that he's awake, we're in a constant mind battle. It is... Uh, like mental warfare, we are bargaining with him. It's, it's, Benjamin, if you want a story, you've got to do this and this. Or, Benjamin, you can't go play if you don't eat, you know, your lunch or eat your breakfast. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a battle with him. And it's amazing how often a three-year-old wins and how often we, we lose. And th- that, that happens all the time. And those of you that have had kids, Ryan, I see you shaking your head. He knows yeah, uh, eventually, you know, when you get two or three kids in, I understand why parents just lay down. And I, now I know why the youngest kid is often the one with that stri- has all the most issues, you know, because your parents are just done. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that's the kind of bargaining that's happening in our house. And uh, it's, it's interesting, but we're getting good at it. We're getting really good at it. And that kind of ties in with the type of bargaining that, that we do within ourselves. And then most importantly, because this is church and we're talking about Jesus and you guys came for something that will help your life to be better, I want to talk about what it is when we bargain with God. Now, this is something that we've all done. Every single person in here has bargained with God. We do it in, in silly situations and we do it in very serious situations. So a silly situation would be, Lord, if I, I know that... I failed this class, and I know that when my teacher put ink on paper, the mark on that paper was a failing mark, and when she put it in the card, that is a failing mark. But I believe, Jesus, that you can do a miracle so that when I pull that card out and show my parents, it doesn't have a failing mark on there. And if you do this, then I will study, study, study for the rest of my life. That's That was my early childhood education. That's the way that I bargained. That's the way I bargained with God. And there's all kinds of silly ways that we do that, but then there's serious ways. We bargain with God when someone is sick, like, Lord, please, if you'll just heal my mom or heal my sister or, or heal this person, then I'll follow you forever. We bargain. We leverage our time. We leverage our obedience. We say, okay, God, I'll tithe. I'll give money if you'll just help my business not to fail. But there's all this bargaining, there's all the bargaining that happens. And before we move too far into the message, I want to give us all common ground that we can stand on as we look at what it is to bargain with God. So I've got a a common definition for you. And Ms. Karina is going to put on the screen here. So bargaining with God is when we try to leverage God's power for our benefit. It's when we try and leverage God's power for our benefit. This is a statement for you to really think about, for you to let soak in. It's, It's, okay, God, you're powerful. You're God. You're, you're the greater power above, and I'm just little old me here, and I have a benefit. I've got something that I want or something that I need, and God, you're powerful, so let me try and leverage your power for my benefit. So again, an example of that would be like, uh, well, it's these statements that we make. God, if you will fix this, then I will do anything. If you'll fix this, I'll do anything. So God, if you'll just heal this person that's sick, 
then I will come to church. Or God, if you'll just save my son, then I will do X, Y, and Z. It, it's, it's us saying, Lord, please, I'll do anything. I'll do anything if you take care of this issue. Now, we've all been there. We've all been there. We've all done this. We've all had these conversations. Um, you know, I often think a very cliche example of this is, uh, you know, if, if there's maybe an unexpected pregnancy or something, it's like, oh, Lord, if that pregnancy test comes back negative, I'll never go out and party. I'll never go out and drink. I'm going to turn my life around and be straight laced. And if you'll just do that, I will do absolutely anything, and I'll give you my time, I'll give you everything. But then when the test comes back negative, it's like, whew, glad that's over and done, and I'm glad I don't have to keep my end of the deal, and I can just continue partying on the way that I was. I mean, that, that's kind of what happens there. But inside of all of this, there's a heart issue. There's, there's what I call like the bottom line. And I want you to look at the bottom line because this is, this is the, the ache of our heart. This is what we want. When we find ourselves in a situation, whether it's a desperate situation or whether it's a silly situation or whether we're dealing with, with a, a, a toddler who's just you know, throwing fits and making your life a little bit difficult, our bottom line is, God, what do I need to do to get you to do what I need you to do? So what do I need to do to get you to do what I need you to do? I want you to imagine this kind of like an emotion, like, a, like an emotional desire. It's, a, it's almost a desperation. God, what do I need to do to get you to do what I need you to do? Casey and I spent about three years, or actually probably closer to six years in this situation. She had a whole bunch of visa issues. There was some corruption with home affairs, and we battled against home affairs for years and years and years, just hoping for her visa to get sorted out, and it did get sorted, but it, it took almost six years, and there were so many nights where both of us sat there and said, God, what do we need to do to get you to do what I need you to do? I need this paperwork sorted. I need my family to be stable. I need my family to be safe. What do I need to do, God, to get you to do that? And sometimes as we ask that question, like we did for so long, we ask God, what do I do? What do I do? And we get kind of exhausted with it, and we end up in a place where we just realize, well, you know what, maybe God's not going to do that. And for us, we woke up so many mornings and said, I don't know if God's going to do this today. I don't know if God's going to do it tomorrow or the day after. So if you think, I want you to imagine in your life, if you're up against a situation where you're just pleading and bargaining and saying, God, where are you? Why is this not changing? Why isn't this happening? Why can't, what do I need to do to get you to meet me where I need to be met? And sometimes God just doesn't answer that in the way that we want him to answer it. And when that happens, we, we get, this, we get this, this almost outburst of emotion that is, since God didn't, well, then forget it. So since God didn't do it, well, you know what? Forget it. I'm just going to do it myself. I'm going to handle it myself. I'm going to stop believing in God. I'm going to stop putting hope into something that isn't worth putting hope into because I'm not seeing fruit from it. I'm not seeing anything come back in my life from it. I, mean, I, I don't know if any one of you can connect with this, but even as I say this out loud on stage, I can think of a hundred different examples in my mind over my life where I begged God to just bargain with God, and it, it didn't happen. I mean, Casey and I did a year-long fast where we didn't, we, we cut all kinds of things out of our diet, fasting and praying for a visa, and it was a year. And finally, at the end of that year, I was like, I don't actually think this thing is going to work. And it, it, guess what? It didn't. A visa didn't come out of that. And so we are often tempted with this idea of, well, you know what? Since God didn't, well, then forget it. And today, to further kind of unpack this, we're going to look at a guy who was actually an expert at bargaining. This is a guy that, that was, was an expert bargainer, and he's a guy that we all know about, and his name is Judas Iscariot. So Judas was one of the 12 disciples that followed Jesus. And I want to give you a little bit of a character breakdown on Judas. Many of you think that Judas is he's a traitor, he's a pretender. Those of you that know anything about the Bible, you kind of have this, you know, Judas is the guy that sold Jesus out. He's the guy that, that gave Jesus away. He's the guy that betrayed Jesus. That's what Judas is known for. But Judas, because he carries that reputation, he has such a bad name. But I kind of want to make a case for, for, for Judas. I want to say, you know what, maybe Judas isn't that bad of a guy. Maybe Judas is actually a nice guy. Maybe Judas is a guy that we should 
uh, look at and we should learn from and we can maybe learn some lessons from him and grow from those lessons. But maybe Judas isn't so different from you and me. Maybe Judas isn't so different from that person that you're thinking, well, they spend so much time bargaining with God and they're, they're the, they, they betray God. And they, you know, if you've got people in your life that you think, man, they are so far from God, you know what? Judas isn't that far off from them, but Judas isn't that far off from you either. And we're going to unpack that. And, and I want to challenge you. Don't sell Judas short. Don't, don't throw him under the bus, as we like to say. Don't, don't discount Judas, because we're going to find ourselves in him. And I think it's going to make us better people for it. So Jesus actually, there's a, a part in the Bible where Jesus starts to unfold to us. Before we even get to Judas in the Bible, Jesus, uh, Jesus unfolds this story for us. So that we can kind of understand before Judas enters the picture that we're all, we all have Judas in us. We're all kind of like Judas. And there was a day when Jesus is walking around and there was this rich young ruler that comes up to Jesus. And this guy comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, how do I have eternal life? So he asked Jesus the question that so many people have asked him. Maybe he overheard the Pharisees asking him the question in one of their kind of grilling sessions. But he asked Jesus that, and Jesus says, well, okay, you need to keep all the commandments, and you need to follow all the, all the rules and the laws and the regulations. So he's referring back to the Old Testament. He's saying, hey, are you doing all the Old Testament stuff? Are you, are you keeping those laws and commandments? And the guy looks at him, and he's like, yes, of course, which we all know is probably not true because no one's perfect, especially when there's hundreds and hundreds of these laws, not only just the Ten Commandments. And so Jesus looks at him and says, okay, great. So you're doing all of that. Well, now the next step for you is I want you to sell everything that you have. Now, this is a rich guy, rich young ruler. It's in the heading in your Bible. And Jesus says, sell everything you have. And come and follow me. Give away all the proceeds from everything you sell. Give it away to the poor and come follow me. And the guy looks at Jesus and he says, I can't do that. I'm too rich. I have too much stuff. I just just can't bring myself to do it. And so what Jesus is illustrating in this story for us is Jesus is illustrating this idea that people with a lot of stuff have a lot to lose. So if you ha- the more that you have, the more that you have to lose. The more that's at stake for you is the more that you have at stake to lose. So this guy, being a rich ruler, being a rich guy, that he had a lot of stuff, therefore it was, he had a lot to lose. And just, if, just because of that, he's like, oh man, it's not like I'm laying down my one pair of dirty sandals and my two robes and now I'm going to go follow Jesus. No, this guy had all kinds of stuff. So yes, it was hard because he had a ton to lose. That's a lot even to wrap his head around. But because of this, because people with a lot of stuff have a lot to lose, consequently, it's a lot for people. Consequently, it's a lot for people who have a lot to lose to choose to follow. Now, what Jesus is illustrating through this rich ruler is those that have a lot to lose have a lot to lose. And if you have a lot to lose, it's really hard to choose to follow because to choose to follow Jesus means you are going to have to give up a lot. And Jesus would go on and explain this, this to his disciples, and he would go on to even explain to them, hey, the rich are, are, are going to have the hardest time getting into heaven. They are going to be the people that are going to have the hardest time. In fact, he gives this, this uh, famous example, and he says, a camel will find it easier to walk through the eye of a needle than a rich man will find it easier to get into the gates of heaven. So Jesus is recognizing that the hardest to reach are, are the rich, are people that have a lot to lose. It's not because money's bad or money's evil. It's because they, they have a lot on the line. They have a lot to lose. That there's a lot at stake for them. That's just hard to even wrap their mind around. And you know, there's an interesting correlation between the, Jesus talking about the rich. Because see, Judas, Judas held the money purse for Jesus' ministry. So, you know, Judas, he always saw that he had a lot to lose by following Jesus. He had to give up that money purse. He had to give up the ministry funds that he was carrying around. So I think that's an interesting correlation that Jesus up front is recognizing that, hey, those that have a lot really struggle to give up a lot. And so after Jesus tells this story, Peter comes in. 
And Peter's one of Jesus' favorite disciples. He's one of the trusted ones. And he shows up and he says this in, in Matthew 26. Peter comes in and he says, or in Matthew 19, 27, Peter answered him. Remember, Jesus has told the rich young ruler, give up everything you have and come follow me. And that's how you find eternal life. And so Peter answers, we've left everything to follow you. It's like Peter slapping himself on the knee and saying, hot dog, we've done that. We're good. Oh, man, if that's the test, then we've aced this test. We're 100%. A plus. We've, we've nailed it. Peter's going, we have everything to follow. What then will there be for us? See, Peter has now bargained with God. There's Judas. There's a little bit of Judas in Peter. Because basically what Peter is doing here is he's putting in the bargain, the equation for bargaining into the story. It's, I've never thought about it that way, but as I studied this, this scripture and as I tried to unpack it, it's like Peter is saying, I've done X. So, Jesus, I have given you all of my life. I've sold everything I have. I've given up everything, and I've come followed you. So, I've put this in to the pile. Now, what are you going to give me? It, it's, it's, it's a bargain. It's an exchange. You know, when Casey and I lived in, well, this is before Casey and I were married. I used to live up around Nelspruit, and I spent a lot of time in Swaziland. And we used to bring a lot of mission teams in. And these mission teams would come over from America. And especially in Swaziland, there was this place called the Golden Mile. I don't know if anyone in here has been to Swaziland and knows about this. But it's essentially kind of a, a strip that has all these booths that are set up. And you can go and buy beadwork and, and things like that. And we used to always take our, our teams to go through there and do some shopping. And I always thought that it was really funny because... They would go, the day before, they would be at what we would call a care point. So it would be like a village. It would be a place where kids are coming, and kids are getting food and taken care of and all of those good things. And these Americans, these wonderful you know, people on a mission trip, they would come, and their hearts would break, and they would want to give everything that they had. They would leave their shoes and leave their extra clothes and just give, 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 give to these people. And, and they would say, we want to give money. And we'd be like, no, you can't do that. Here's how we are helping them and, and trying to walk them through that. But they wanted to give. Then the very next day, we would go to the Golden Mile. And I would watch those same compassionate people walk up to an old go-go who's selling a beaded necklace for 10 rand. And they'd say, I'll give you one rand. And they'd come back to the van and they'd say, I got 500 rand worth of stuff for 7 rand. And I'd be like, great. That's, that, that, that's their existence. I'm so glad that you're good at bargaining with these people. Because, you know, you, you, I just thought it was always funny. They go from one day saying, I'll give everything I have, to the next day kind of treating it like a medal of honor. Like, look how low I got these prices. But anyway, so what, what Peter is doing here is he's, bar, he's bargaining with Jesus. He's saying, I put my chips in. Now, what am I going to get out from this? So right there, let me just go ahead and say, there's Judas is in Peter. Now, Peter is one of Jesus' closest disciples. So if there can be Judas in one of Jesus' closest disciples, then there's definitely Judas in, in you and I. And then talking about Judas, if we start to go into Judas and his part that he plays in this story. See, Judas, as, as he walked around with Jesus, Judas, he kind of had a problem. See, Judas had these expectations of Jesus. And then Jesus had these problems that he gave Judas. So it really was about Judas' expectations versus Jesus' prop, the problems that Jesus had. Let me explain it to you. So Judas had this expectation, like many did, that Jesus was the Messiah. Now we take that for granted because in our Bible and in teaching on stage, we say Jesus is the Messiah, especially with Easter coming up. We all kind of know that and recognize that. But what that meant to a lot of people in this time is that Jesus as the Messiah... Was, was prophetically proclaimed to come and set the Jewish people free. So what they thought over and over and over again, and what Judas believed with all of his heart, was that Jesus was going to free them from the Romans, and that Jesus was going to come bring freedom back to the people. He was going to restore the Jewish people just like they were when David was king or Solomon was king, when they had just the, the full glory and instead of being under the oppression of the Romans, Jesus was now going to set them free. That's what so many people thought. In fact, there were many times where Jesus did miracles and these crowds gathered. 
And they were uplifting Jesus as the Messiah, meaning we're going to go overthrow Rome. We're going to go free the people. And Jesus would remove himself because he said, no, 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 that's not the kind of Messiah that I am. Yes, I'm going to come set you free, but not in that way. So Judas has this expectation, of course, this is what Jesus is. He believes it with all of his heart and soul. But Jesus gives him some problems. The first problem was that Jesus did not hate the Romans. That's a bit of a head-scratcher for Judas, because Judas is saying he's supposed to free us from the Romans, but Jesus doesn't seem to have that big of a problem with the Romans. So I can already see Judas thinking, I'm not sure this is working out the way that I thought that it was going to work out. Now, another problem that, that Jesus had is Jesus actually had more of a problem with the, with the people that worked in the temple, with the temple leaders, with the chief priests, with Caiaphas, like we talked about last week. I mean, he even just called them vipers and, and, and snakes. And so again, Judas is here with his expectation that Jesus is going to set them free. And instead, Jesus, he, he doesn't have a problem with the Romans, but he does have a problem with the temple guards and with the temple priests. And so Judas is like, how is this going to work? I just don't understand how this is going to work. Because Jesus is doing the opposite. He should hate the Romans and love the, the temple priests. Why, why is it the other way around? And then the thing that really just blew Judas's mind, because he held the money purse. He was the treasurer for the disciples, that Jesus didn't have this real love or value on money. So Jesus would collect money. You know, they traveled around, and people would donate to them and would give to them. And that's what they lived on. And Jesus, when they would get a lot of money, Jesus would give it away. Or he would invest it in other people. Or, or he, he, he didn't hold on to it. He knew that God funded his ministry. And so holding on to this money and treating it like the most important thing was not a big deal for him. So he would, he would let that go. So that really bothered Judas. It bothered him a lot. Because how do you have a revolution if you have no funding? War costs money. Revolutions cost money. I mean, how's Judas going to print posters and stick them up all over the place and let people know? Because there's no money to even do that. Do you know how much the city of Cape Town charges to put posters on the poles? It's a lot of money. So Judas is doing the equation. He's saying, well, you can't afford this. And so with all that frustration in Judas, because of the problems that Jesus was causing, there comes a final straw. And it's wrapped around this beautiful piece, this beautiful artifact called the alabaster jar. Now Judas has, has just waited patiently, 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 and he can't handle it anymore. And then there was this act of generosity, this act of Jesus just being completely uh, uh, just worshipped and humbled and loved on by this woman. But she has this amazing act of generosity towards Jesus, and it ends up being the thing that just breaks Judas's mind in half. He just can't understand how it's going to work, and it forces him to say, I'm going to take things into my own hands. And so the story of the alabaster jar is this. We look at Matthew 26, 6 through 7. So while Jesus was in Bethany, now Jesus is in Bethany because Lazarus was just resurrected. So we talked about that last week. Lazarus has been resurrected. Jesus is in Bethany. He's at the home of Simon the leper, which is kind of weird already because lepers were supposed to live outside of town. They weren't supposed to live inside town. But maybe this is a reputation. I don't know if he smelt bad or if at one point in time he had leprosy. But he was known as Simon the leper. And Jesus is there. And a woman comes to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume. Now these jars of perfume, they were sealed. And what this, this wasn't, see, they, people used oils and perfumes to do a lot of things. Treat people like a medicine would do, uh, wash people so that they didn't smell bad. There were all kinds of things that they did. But there was these really special oils that were set aside. These perfumes that were set aside for extremely special occasions. And they were sealed in these alabaster jars, which meant the only way to access it was to break the neck. And once you broke it, you had to use all of it. And so this woman takes this very expensive perfume. It was about a year's worth of her, of her wages. A year's worth of wages. So think about what you make in a year. And boil that down to a little jar of perfume. And you just use it up in one moment. And so she pours it on his head as he was reclining at the table. So it's an extreme gesture of honor for Jesus. And then it goes on to say in verse 8, When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. So the disciples are upset. See, John tells us 
that this was Judas that was indignant. But Matthew is saying, actually, all the disciples were also indignant. It means they're aggravated. They're mad. They don't understand why this has happened and why Jesus has allowed this to happen, why other people allowed this woman to do this, or why this woman would even be motivated to waste all this perfume on Jesus. And they even say, why this waste? This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor, I'm sure. I'm sure that's what they thought. So then it goes on, aware of this, because Jesus knows what they're thinking, because he's in their head, he's in all your heads. He knows all of our thoughts. He knows the way that our, our heart works and the way that we think. Jesus said to them, why are you bothering this woman? She's done a beautiful thing for me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. And then Jesus goes on to say, Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Now, what's amazing about this is this woman did something that the the disciples thought was insignificant. And what Jesus did is he took this, this thing that everyone else thought was a mistake, and he tied it to the gospel. So that everywhere the gospel was taken, this woman's story of generosity would go with it. How amazing is that? That right there, Jesus ties generosity to the gospel message. So now you can't take the gospel message somewhere without taking the message of generosity and blessing with it. Because of what this woman does. Jesus is brilliant. It's amazing the way that he puts the things that actually matter together. And so out of response, out of response to this moment, out of response to Jesus saying this. Then one of the twelve. So this is our, our transition moment in the story. In a movie, this is when the music would change. This is when things would go dark. This is when the back alley stuff would start to happen. So then one of the twelve, the one called Judas, went to the chief priest and asked. So Judas goes to Caiaphas, the chief priest. And Judas has had it. And the reason that he goes to the chief priest is he says, I'm going to force Jesus' hand. I'm going to make Jesus be the Messiah. I'm going to make Jesus. Jesus fit the agenda that I have for him. I'm going to force Jesus to step up and be who he should be. And so he goes to the chief priest and he says, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? Now, the reason he asked that is because the chief priest could not get access to Jesus because of the crowds. They were terrified of the crowds who were just gathering for Jesus in huge numbers. And, and Judas comes and he says, if I can get him out of the crowd and I can deliver him to you, then what would you give me? So here's Judas bargaining. He was bargaining with Jesus. Now he's bargaining with people. But, I mean, he's not that bad of a guy because he's bargaining for what he believes in. He's bargaining on behalf of Jesus. I mean, all he's going to do is give Jesus a nudge. Just give Jesus this little push. As soon as Jesus gets this little push, it's going to accelerate who Jesus is. And Jesus is going to say, okay, well, now I'm out there. I've got to do this. And boom, Jesus is going to become the Messiah. And he's going to lead people to freedom. But instead, that, that's not the way the story goes. But when he says, what will you give him? They counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. So Judas, he's watching. So I want you to imagine Judas has had this secret conversation. And now Jesus is walking through the crowds and there's always people around him. And Judas is always there lurking, lurking, lurking. I wonder when Jesus is going to get alone. I wonder when I can hand him over. And then it just falls right in his lap. Right in the lap of Judas. Because Jesus says, I want to take you all up for a dinner, for a last meal. It's going to be the last Passover. And they go privately up to this upper room and they have this meal. And as they're having this meal and as they're alone, Jesus has this idea of after this meal, we're going to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And when we go there, we're going to be alone and we're going to pray. And Judas says, that's it. That's my moment. That's when I'm going to hand Jesus over. And I can imagine maybe Judas is kind of sweating. He's like, is this really going to happen? Am I really going to do this? Is this this really what I'm going to do? Yes, this is the right thing to do. I'm not going to second guess myself. Yes, I need to hand Jesus over. This is for the good of Jesus. It's for the good of all of us as people. I mean, it's not like Judas was an evil guy here. Judas is just trying to push Jesus along. He's just trying to get Jesus going, kind of like we do. 
We all, Jesus, come on. Hey, Jesus, let me motivate you to go ahead and help me faster. Jesus, let me motivate you to go ahead and solve my problems. Jesus, let me motivate you to feel sorry for me. Let me motivate you to do that. That's the same heart Judas has. No different from you. You're no different from him. So Judas, he's sitting in this dinner, and this is something that I never really understood. So they're, in the, they're, in the, the, they're sitting around the table. We've all seen the famous painting, you know, the last Passover meal. And all these guys are hanging out, and they're sitting down. And I always wondered, how does Jesus confront Judas without all the other guys knowing and without Judas's cover getting blown? Because it seems, when the Bible tells it, it kind of seems like, it's, how do these other guys not hear the things that Jesus says? And so, yeah, it, it, I was always confused by it. How does Judas get away with it? I would think that Peter would stand up with his sword and just stab Judas and be like, nope, not going to happen. But that's not the way that it, that it goes, and there's a reason for it. And it, it's so, here's the story. So, after he had said this, Jesus was troubled by a spirit and testified. Very truly, I tell you. So what he's already said is he's kind of told the disciples uh, about what's going to happen to him. So he's going to go to he- He's going to die. He's going to be put on the cross. He's going to raise after three days. And so Jesus was troubled in the spirit and he testifies. Very truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. And I guess Judas would then, you know, like really pucker up and maybe say like, oh, really? You think so? I No, come on. You know, we're all here, we're happy, we're your trusted 12. There's, there's no way this is going to happen. And Jesus goes on, and he, he, he looks and he says in the next verse, he says, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered him. So there was a bit of an exchange that happened just before this, but for time's sake, Judas takes bread from the table after Jesus has said this, and Satan entered him. And so Jesus told him, so he looks right at Judas, what are you about to... What you are about to do, do it quickly. This is where I think, how did the disciples not hear this? Peter, where were you? Where, where, I mean, you're all sitting in a little room, laying down, reclining at a table, eating together. And Jesus looks at Judas and says, what you're about to do, do it quickly. And so then Judas gets up and leaves. And he goes off to carry out his plan. Why was that not suspicious? Why did the other people not know that? Well, we find out in John 13:28 it says but no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him so no one no one knew which is it's kind of crazy so Judas goes out he goes to the high priest tells him where where Jesus is the high priest they go after Jesus they get Jesus uh, Jesus is then taken to trial and then something really interesting happens something serious happens for Judas Judas thinks that all Jesus is going to do is get arrested and he's going to step in as the Messiah. But then Jesus ends up going to Caiaphas, who ends up taking him to Pilate. Judas finds out that Jesus goes to Pilate. I mean, I feel like this is an episode of Generations. Like, I'm explaining all these different <laughs> things here to you. But, so, his mom says, they're a brother. But Jesus ends up going to Pilate. Word gets back to Judas. And Judas knows this is trouble. Because this means Jesus is going to be crucified. He's going to die. And when that happens, let's look at Judas's reaction. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. So there we go. Judas is he's no different from us. And you're no different from him. Judas didn't mean for Jesus to die. And he says, I, I, here, take the money back. The money, is, it's great, but it's not really what I want. And so Judas is left with this feeling that I hope you never feel, but I know you will. And it's this thought of regret. And then, is it worth it? This is a hard question for Judas to answer. And in fact, he ends up not being able to answer that. Not being able to answer it well. And so in the next verse, and this is the end of Judas' story. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. So Judas goes to the chief priest and says, I've, hold on, this is not the way I wanted this to go. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I bargained, I pushed my agenda. Jesus is not supposed to die. I do not want this. I did not mean for this to happen. I was just trying to motivate this, this thing to play out, but it wasn't supposed to be motivated this way or happen this way. And so he says, what, what is this to us? Or, or he says, I've betrayed innocent blood. And then the chief priest priest look at G, look at Judas 
and they say, that's your responsibility. They don't care. They don't care at all. That's your responsibility. You put yourself in Judas's shoes of having kind of an innocent heart, maybe not fully innocent, but we're not innocent either. And you just set off this chain reaction that ends with the Savior of the world being put to death, and it all sits on your shoulders. And Jesus, in his loving kindness, doesn't even sell him out to the other disciples. And now you find that this thing has gotten way out of control. And then those same, chief, those same priests, the chief priest looks at you, and he says, not my problem, it's your responsibility. And so Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and he hanged himself. That's such a, a sad thing. That's not the ending that Jesus intended. That's not the ending that Jesus intended for Judas. Jesus came for all of us, including Judas. And what's interesting is if a man that walked with Jesus for three years can make this mistake, you know, we can too. We're also susceptible to that. And that there's a truth, and this is the last truth that I want you to take in before we, we bring the band back up. But it's just Karina's got it on a slide for you. When we barter with God rather than surrender, we are responsible like Judas for the outcome. Who? That's tough. But you know what? This isn't the way God designed it. It's not the way you have to live your life. It's not the way Judas had to live his life. It's when Jesus came, he came so that we don't have to live this way. So I'm going to read this to you one more time. When you barter with God rather than surrender, you are responsible for the outcome. But watch what happens. Watch what happens here. When we surrender, God is responsible for the outcome of your journey. Right? I don't know which one you want, but I, I want this one. But every day I find myself bartering with God. And when we barter with God, what that is, what that is in you and what that is in me, it's just our human nature coming up. It's fear. It's we're scared. It's we don't understand. We don't know where life is taking us. It's, it's, it's God, I, I don't, do I trust you? Do I not trust you? I, you know, God, am I going to hurt? Is this going to hurt me? God, is this going to hurt my family? We, we come out of this place of, of innocence. No one bargains with God because you're, you're evil. Or because you're just trying to get God or get other people. No, you come, you come out of the innocence of your heart. And I like to believe that Judas was that. And that we have a little bit of that in us. But let me tell you, this word surrender, it may be the hardest thing in the world that you ever do. But if you can take that step and you can surrender, then you no longer have to be responsible for your life. Instead, God becomes responsible for the outcome of your journey. In fact, when you do this, you can just close your eyes and you can just follow God and walk with Him. And so I'm going to pray for us. And while I pray for us, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to think about what it is in your life that you need to stop bargaining for. I want you to think about what it is in your life that you need to stop bargaining for. And instead, I want you to think, what would it be like for me to surrender this thing to God so that he becomes responsible for my journey. He becomes responsible for the healing. He becomes responsible for the bills to come in. He becomes responsible for the marriage. He becomes responsible for my job. He becomes responsible for my children. He becomes responsible for my vehicles. He becomes responsible for my heart. He becomes responsible for how I love myself. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray.